This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome again to Condo Insider. I hope you have visited us before. Uh, for our new visual people watching us, uh, we're about associations in Hawaii, mostly condo associations. About 40% of our population has been estimated lives in an association. We try to bring interesting topics about condo living uh, for discussion. And I would remind everybody, we do have a hotline. You can call in with a question if you dial 808-374-2014. What's been almost every day in our headlines has been a recent high-rise condo fire in Hawaii. And there's some very interesting issues about living in a condo. And, and so I decided to ask Sue Savio of Insurance Associates to visit with us today and talk about insurance and what happens when there's a disaster. But I do want to start this show by saying that this is a general topic about insurance for associations. And the big fire was Marco Polo, and this is not about Marco Polo. It's about in general nature, about how all this works and what your risks are as a homeowner. And even though that was the catalyst to make me invite you to the show, it was. it's an independent show strictly about insurance and associations and what the potential risks are for you or your association. So, Sue, welcome to the show again. And remind everybody, uh, I can't imagine anybody in our industry doesn't know you, but uh, oh. remind everybody about you again and your company. Okay, well, I was born and raised here. I've been in the insurance business since 1975. I handle, our agency handles condominium insurance. We have about a thousand of them throughout the state. That is what I do, condo insurance. And remind us, generally speaking, under the statute, the condo statute, what insurance does an association have to carry? Okay, an association has to carry property insurance if they have property. They have to carry liability for all their common and limited common areas. They have to carry bond insurance in case protect their money. They carry umbrella insurance. They carry workers' comp if they have employees, TDI, you know, workers' comp for injuries on the job, TDI for injuries off the job. So depending upon what they have, they have certain things they have to carry. And of course, directors and officers insurance because their directors and officers are serving for free, you know, and they need to be protected as well. So that's pretty much about what a condo needs. And there's probably a fidelity bond to a crime right. policy, too, right? there is a bond right? for their money. Correct. So that the money that either the agent has and or their employees has, uh, either through the agent or through their own policy, they're protected for, for that as well. Correct. So anyway, we had this major disaster. Yes, we did. What happens when, when you have a disaster? I mean, I mean, obviously, it's all over the news. Is, is anybody showing up at the property? What's going on? Of course. The, we, we obviously saw it on TV ourselves. We filed the claim instantly. The adjuster for the company was down there waiting for the fireman to put out the fire. He spent the weekend there, I swear. And in fact, I did talk to him. He said he maybe had six hours of sleep. He's been there daily since. I has, have other people as well. But yes, we filed the claim. We get the adjuster out when we start to work. And this type of claim is under the property policy. Yes, is that correct? The, the fire damage and the soot damage and the water damage is all property. And so we often hear that by the time the building was built today, the building code has changed. Are they covered for changes in the building code? And, or how does that work? The insurance policy has something called building ordinance. And because there are changes in the code, we do have you know, many millions for building ordinance. So because of change of code, certain things are going to be required when we go to rebuild. And the association does have some building ordinance coverage. And there's probably a limit on that. Of course. Just like there's a limit on the building, a limit on the building ordinance, there's limits on everything. And I've heard also that on larger buildings, you know, and of course, you know, some of these buildings, you know, they're huge. Yes. And the values are in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Correct. Um, on, on those types of about does a single insurance company insure those? Or, or do, I've heard a term reassurance once in a while, because uh, I'm assuming that if you had all that insurance with one company, they could become exposed as well, but in theory. But uh, uh, what, what, what is this reinsurance insurance thing we hear about? Okay, so what normally happens is the insurance companies who are going to insure large projects or millions of dollars, they don't want the whole exposure to themselves. So they have contracts with reinsurers. They literally take their insurance and reinsure it with someone else who maybe takes the next $5 million or the next $10 million. 
So when, take for example the Trade Center, when it went down, there was somebody who probably had a thousand dollars for a premium for the last million dollars of the Trade Center, not ever expecting to see it go. So in other words, there were many carriers on that, and there are many carriers that will be on Marco Polo, but First Insurance is the main lead. They handle the whole claim. They have that power. They are. So for all of our uh, viewers out there, if you have a larger building, it's probable that your insurance company has reinsured it. Yes. And it's probable that, is it, is it proper to say that your primary carrier, let's just make it up, that they insured the first $5 million, that they're on the hook for the first $5 million and the reinsurance is after the primary carrier's uh, uh, insurance? That's very fair to say. That is how it works. But please understand, the first carrier the, has the primary layer is the one that handles the whole claim. You don't deal with an adjuster for this much and an adjuster for the next. It's all one adjuster. So it's kind of like uh, the, the, the primary carrier, you use their insurance first, and then it moves on down the road, I guess. Right. And, and most board members or condo owners never know there is this reinsurance. It's not anything they're going to get involved with because first insurance is going to be on it. Now, those reinsurance carriers, they sell insurance publicly also? Are they, are they specialists in the they're reinsurance? They're specialists in the reinsurance world. They sell to insurance companies. So that's what their primary thing that's is. That's their primary function. And one of the, and I'm only talking to property policy right now. Okay. So one of the common insurances all associations carry for a lot of reasons is the umbrella. Does umbrella cover property claims? No, it does not cover property claims. The only po thing that covers property claims is your property policy. And so, I remember this term, and I know we didn't chat about this, but sometimes, you know, the adjuster says you should insure your building for $50 million. And some board says, well, I'm only going to insure it for $25 million. And there's a phrase called, in the policy, called co-insurance. That is correct. Could you, could you kind of tell us what that is so okay. we can warn all these people out there the risk of not properly covering your building? Okay. First of all, under condo statute in Hawaii, you are supposed to insure to 100%. So to do anything less is to go against what's required by the bylaws and get yourself into trouble for insurance. The insurance companies say, yes, you're a concrete structure. Yes, you don't ever think you're going to have 100% loss. But if you decide to only insure for 25%, 50%, they're going to say, OK, the loss was a million dollars. You should have been insured for this figure, but you only insured for 50%. 50% of your million dollar loss is a half a million dollars. Now we subtract our deductible. Here's your check. So it doesn't behoove anybody to underinsure. Okay. Yeah, I can see the problem, but a lot of people think they're doing a benefit to the association, um, and it's not that they intentionally do that, but they look for data that would give them some basis to say, well, the adjuster's number is wrong. It's not really 50 million. It's really only 30 million, and and there's a lot of risk associated with that. If it turns out you have a claim and you haven't insured it for the proper amount of money. We have normally three to four fire claims a year in our agency. We know what it costs to rebuild the, uh, you know, the typical condo, a high-end condo, concrete versus wood frame. We've had those claims. We know what the contractors are going to charge. So we're pretty always much on accurate what we need. We t work with our companies as well. So it's not, we're not picking a figure out of the sky. We're also not saying, having the board tell us, well, we only want to insure for $20 million because I've been asked to do things like that. And I said, well, you know, you're worth 30 million. I can't do that. Go find another agent, but I'm not doing that. So you have to be very careful because you're, the board can get themselves into trouble, but you always need to ensure two value, replacement costs. And it's my understanding in general that when you as an association purchase property insurance, right. you've insured it for, I'm gonna call the as-built conditions, the original cabinets, the original floor, the common areas, those types of things. But that doesn't protect the homeowner, does it? No. It protects the homeowner only in that they get the as originally built. But most homeowners, especially in older condos, they have upgraded. They've ripped out kitchens and they've put beautiful coa wood floors in and matching coa cabinets and they've got mirrors on their walls. All of these are upgrades. These upgrades are not covered under the master policy because the bylaws in Hawaii say as originally built. Even if we wanted to include all of those and go into each unit and check it out, there's no way to do it, okay? So we have to cover as originally built, but at today's cost. You know, we're gonna give you, maybe it was basic cabinets, but we're gonna give you today's basic cabinets. We're gonna give you today's basic flooring. Let's say it came with carpet. 
and you now have a wood floor down. Well, the difference is going to have to be picked up on a policy called an HO6. The master policy can only cover as originally built. Well, that makes sense in a way because should other owners who didn't upgrade be responsible for the increased cost for those who did upgrade? Right. And so those upgrades are covered under the HO6, right? Correct. But you have this issue if you're a tenant, or excuse me, not a tenant, a landlord, you could have lost income, right? Right. If you live there, you could have loss of use of your place and need a place to live. Right. If you're a tenant, you may not have a place to live. And let's stay with the owner's policy, which is the HO6 policy. Right. Where do you see people make mistakes on the HO6 policy? Okay. So the HO6 is a policy designed for condo unit owners, whether you live in it or rent it out. Okay. You can all buy the same policy. Under an HO6, there's something called dwelling or building. And that's where you put your upgrades in. So if you put $30,000 of improvements into your unit, you want to make sure you have that $30,000 under dwelling plus the association's deductible. Because if you cause a claim in Hawaii under 514B, the association can charge the deductible back to you. So you want to make sure your insurance company is going to pay that. My washing machine leaked and I caused $20,000 worth of damage to the units below and myself. What I can do then is say, okay, I need to make sure I have a $10,000 deductible. If the association has a $10,000 deductible, some associations have twenty-five. dollars Whatever that deductible is, plus your improvements, need to be under the dwelling or building portion of your policy. Okay? So that means when there's a fire or when there's a water claim and you've damaged your beautiful floor, we're going to give you money. The master policy is going to give you money for carpet because it came with carpet, let's say $3,000, and your floor was $20,000 because it's wood. The 17,000 difference will come from the HO6 if you're insured correctly. Okay? Right. Now, the other thing is loss of use you mentioned. There is a section for loss of use. And the problem with loss of use is the landlord says, okay, I get $2,000 a month in rent times 12. I need $24,000 worth of loss of rent. Many people say, especially owners, don't realize how much it costs to go rent a place because your maintenance fees are due. Your mortgage is still due if you have one, and now you've got to go rent a place because you can't live in your unit. So you need a robust, what I call today, a robust HO6 that has enough money under loss of use to take care of you. Because the association's policy does not offer you any type of loss of use. It has to be your policy. And that particular portion of the HO6 policy, and we're going to take a break after this question, but that particular portion of the policy is based on a dollar limit, not like number of days or months or Correct. like I get to get accommodations until the, my unit's fixed. It's, it's based on what limits you buy with respect. So if you only bought $10,000 worth of uh, loss of use, then in fact, if rents are $2,000, you you'd only have five months, then you're on your own. Is that right? That is exactly right. There is a limit on that. Just like the dwelling and the, and the improvements, there's a limit there. So if you really made $50,000 worth of improvements and you're only covering 25, you're going to be short if something happens. Same thing with loss of use. If you only got $10,000, as you said, and rents are $2,000 a month and you're going to be out of your unit for a year, you didn't buy enough. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and come back with Sue. I have more questions about insurance and uh, she's the right lady because she knows a heck of a lot about it, more about it than I do. We'll be right back. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sound. So we do it. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here with Sue Savio talking about insurance <laughs> in light of a disaster, such as a fire or hurricane or something else along that line. We're 
talking about the homeowner's HO6 policy. And we discussed briefly, it'll pay for up, any upgrades you have to the property, like new cabinets or wood floors, Alcoa, whatever it may be. And we talked briefly about the fact that it will cover your loss of use of the property if you live there, as far as giving you another accommodation. But when you set the limit in that policy and say, I only want to insure for, it's a dollar limit, five or 10 or $20,000, once that money runs out, you're on your own. So you've got to be careful when looking at the limits you set on the HO6 policy. But then we have tenants or, and people who rent them out, landlords, who depend on that income to pay their mortgage and maintenance fees and everything else. And because there's a fire or an earthquake or whatever, assuming they have earthquake coverage. Yeah, I was going to say, no earthquake coverage. <laughs> yeah, most people don't carry that no, in Hawaii. Okay, yeah. So we'll say hurricane. Okay. Um, uh, that, in fact, they would have a cash flow because they probably still have to pay their maintenance fees and their mortgage. Sure. So how does the loss of income portion work? Okay, so for a landlord, the loss of income is loss of rents, okay? So loss of use. They've lost the ability to rent that unit. Because they've lost the ability to rent that unit, they know what they rent it for, 3000 a month. They've bought hopefully $36,000 worth of coverage, let's say for the year, and they know the insurance company is going to say, okay, it may take three months to rebuild, five, but uh, they will pay the landlord the money so the landlord can go ahead and pay his maintenance fees and his mortgage. That's how it works, just like it does for the owner who has had loss for use. So they would be getting, the, assuming the rents were 3000 they'd right. get up to $36,000 in income, and then they would still pay their mortgage and still pay their maintenance fees. Sure. Going back to the owner occupant a second, okay. they still have to pay their maintenance fees too. Of course they do. And that's not insured. Well, they're paying their maintenance fees because they have loss of use, so they can afford to go live elsewhere right. because somebody's paying them to live elsewhere so they can still afford their maintenance fees, they can still afford their mortgage. If you have to put maintenance fees, mortgage, and loss of use, many people cannot do that. Right. And then, so the short answer is they still have to pay their maintenance fees. They still fees. have to pay the maintenance <laughs> fees. You're not going to get away from that. And now we get to the, 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 the poor tenant who's just renting there. Um, does the homeowner's HO6 policy protect them for a place to live? For a tenant, this policy called an HO4. It's designed for a tenant because a tenant is not in need of uh, insuring the building or the improvements because tenants don't make improvements. Okay, so they have a HO4 which covers their contents. It covers their loss of use. So if I'm a tenant that was renting and my unit is trashed and I can't rent, I can go ahead and because I want to come back there, let's say my unit's not too bad, the landlord said I can come back once he fixes it up, it's going to be two, three months, but I have to go elsewhere to rent. I can use my loss of use under my HO4 if I'm a tenant. Maybe my furniture got trashed, so when, once the unit is available, or the insurance company will give me my uh, uh, contents, so I can go ahead and buy the stuff that I need to live. So it's just like an HO6, but not including the portion about the dwelling. And for a, a tenant to buy that type of can you give me an approximate range of what that costs for a tenant? 150, 250. I mean, somewhere within there. Sometimes you can get it less than that, but you've got to realize that it's not so much the price that you're looking to buy. You're looking to buy the right amount of coverage. And I think what happens to a lot of people when there is a disaster like we just went through is they all realize they did not have enough. And what everyone is saying that has called me on it is, oh, I didn't have enough contents. I didn't have enough loss of use. I should have had more. And when they find out how cheap it is, you know, instead of spending 150 or $200, gee, if I'd spend another $100, I'd be fine. So it's really, I know everybody is price conscious because we all live from paycheck to paycheck, but it is important to understand what happens if, and if I cannot live in my unit, where am I gonna go? How am I gonna live? I don't have any relatives here, or I have no one that's gonna give me a place to stay. I mean, those are the issues that people are facing now. Now, do you think from your experience, Bad question to ask you probably. Most people buy enough insurance for this? No. I am convinced that they do not buy enough insurance for this. I've not had one call from anybody that says, oh, I bought extra coverage. Shucks, I spent too much money on my H06. Everybody has said, I didn't buy enough. Oh, I should have done this. I should have had more of this. People, when you don't have a catastrophe to look at and you just, hey, I've lived here for 20 years. I don't need much. My contents isn't worth much. Then when you start to lose it all, you realize that, gee, you know, I did have a lot of stuff, and I really do need to have more loss of use. And, yeah, no one's called me to tell me they were overinsured.
Well, because the pool, I would call it, you know, when you insure at H06, from an insurance company's point of view, they're looking at like a, the state of Hawaii, a much larger pool, so the rates are really very low, uh -huh. where it's not like just that building. It's more, you can get really good rates at two to three, four hundred bucks a year, depending on your coverage requirements, and protect you against a disaster. Correct. And it's always nice to not have to pay it when you don't have a disaster. The problem is, what are you going to do if you do have a disaster? How do you protect your family and make sure that you can meet all your obligations and have a place to live? And even though it's going to be inconvenient no matter what once you've had a fire, but right. sounds to me people need to go back and look at this a little more carefully. Maybe talk to their insurance professional about what the what the worst case risk situation may be with respect to that. Right. Well, and I think this is a worst case situation. I think most people need to go back and say, okay, I live in a condo. I what are my coverage limits? And oh my, most people will say, I don't have enough. If that happened to me, I don't have a year's worth of loss of rent. I really have only 10,000 of contents. And oh my goodness, when I was poor and first bought this condo, maybe that was enough because I had early Salvation Army. But now I've got real furniture and I've got pots and pans and I've got all kinds of electronics. 10,000 isn't enough. So I mean, people do need, who are not impacted right now, do need to go and look at their coverages, call their agent, and say, I want realistic figures here because this could happen to me. So what I recommend, recommend I recollect, <laughs> is that going back to, you look at association insurance policies. And in the old days, you know, you could buy one, two, and three thousand dollar deductibles. Now they're ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar deductibles. And one of the positions of the industry when they adopted 514B was they had the ability to force people to buy HO6 policies although the limits are very, very low. There's really no standard with respect to that. And the reason that was done, it was actually cheaper for the owner instead of the association trying to buy a very low deductible, we have an isolated building of 100, 150 units where the carrier is gonna put that into its premium. It was easier to have a much higher deductible and have the owners purchase the difference through an HO6 policy. It was more economical for the owner on an overall basis. Is that kind of how you remember it? Yeah, that's sort of how it got started. Then, of course, we have all these water claims because our pipes are getting old. So the insurance industry, of course, if you want to continue on and you're not going to re retrofit your pipes, the deductible has gone up for the condominiums. And so what used to be the standard $1,000 deductible, you know, then went to $5,000. The standard is slowly becoming $10,000. Condos that have a lot of water claims, they have twenty five. Some even have a $50,000 deductible. So that has to be picked up by the unit owner. That's with why 514B saying the board has the right to uh, charge everyone, you know, force everyone to have a homeowners, and the limits they send out, they normally say on the dwelling side, they usually put the deductible there, saying you've got to have a 15,000 or a 10,000, because we have a $10,000 deductible, plus your improvements. So that is being yeah. sent and out. I guess that was my point. If you go back to the yeah. owner doing the HO6 policy, they better make sure under the dwelling they've covered the association deductible because I'm not sure there aren't associations with 25 or maybe even $50,000 deductibles because they had a lot of claims. There are. And There's if your unit is the one and the, the condo statute gives them the right to charge it back to the owner, if you haven't insured yourself properly for that. So I think it's probably a good thing for owners and uh, to carefully look at what their HO6 policy is. and. And I don't know if they legally can require a tenant to buy an HO4 policy in their lease. The association cannot afford, cannot force a tenant to buy an HO4. The landlord can. I can say as a landlord, you can't rent my unit unless you show me proof of an HO4. I huh. can do that as a landlord, as part of renting my unit. But the association cannot force a tenant, but they can force an owner to have it. And one good thing that's coming out of this is I'm getting a lot of calls from insurance agents. Sue, I'm going to be writing an HO6 for someone who lives in this building. What's the association's deductible? That always thrills me when somebody will call from another company and say, what is the deductible? And I always tell them it's this amount. You know, this building's been around a long time. There's probably lots of improvements. Make sure you get them covered. Yes. Well, going off of HO6 and going back to the association side for a okay. So now we have a disaster, a fire. Right. Who's in charge? I mean, who... I mean, all of a sudden you've done some mitigation, some water extraction, you've sent some people in to make sure the place is safe, and you've kind of buttoned it up. And I guess 
who has made those decisions on the mitigation and who's making the decisions, what are the next steps to do? Is it, is it a collaborative effort or how's that, how's that kind of happen? Seems like a big, big project. It's a huge project and it's not there yet with, you know, currently with Marco Polo. It takes, it's a very long time. You have a lot of units. You can't have 50 contractors working. There's not enough elevators. There's not enough parking. There's no place to stage your repair work. So it's going to be, it has to be a methodical project. And you can't do, someone can't do one unit owner, can't go in and do his unit, and then they decide to clean the, because of the asbestos and things, they're going to do the hallways. It has to be done together. So it's very much a long process. It starts off with the adjuster, obviously, and the extractors who came the night of the fire or, or the next morning and the next week, couple weeks to dry out what they can, you know, and to clean out the hallways and things of that sort. But now it's going to be, all right, contractor, insurance company, board, Everybody, let's sit down and how are we going to do this? We're going to start at the top, we're going to start at the bottom. Where are we going to go to get these units going? An, an important question, back to the association insurance. So you've had a unit damaged and to the as-built. When the association gets the check, what do they do? Do, do? do they fix the unit? Do they give the owners the money? Okay. What happens to their proceeds from this policy? Okay, so the proceeds in the fire insurance policy will be made out to the named insured, which is the association. It will be sent to their management company, who will deposit it into the account. Along with the proceeds will be a breakout of what the insurance company is paying. It may be 10 units, it may be 100 units, whatever it is, it'll say unit and the amount they're giving to them. So that would go back after it's deposited, this management company is going to be cutting a check and sending the backup to each owner as to here's the proceeds from your claim for the inside of your unit, for the as-built. Now the unit owner will also get a check from his HO6 carrier. Okay, because he's got an HO6, and let's say he had, you know, fifty thousand dollars worth of improvements coverage. He's going to get that fifty thousand dollars plus what we're giving him, and then he's got enough money there, hopefully, to put back his unit the way he wants it. So the short answer is that the association is going to, as the insurer, is going to get the money, but then they're going to distribute it to the owner, who's going to be responsible for repair the inside of his unit, right? Recognizing right. his coordination because of the common areas and the common elements and right. and everything else. We're down to about our last minute, so quick question. I know it's tough when the answer is shortly. Will these types of claims have a big effect on premiums? I think it will affect a little bit the non-sprinkler buildings. I don't think it will affect the sprinkler buildings. It's, um, and I don't think it's going to be doubling anybody's cost. I think you're going to be talking maybe, you know, 3 4% at the beginning until it, it, this is a long haul. We don't really know right. what it's going to affect. I think the HL6 premiums, will not so much go up, but I think people will look at their HL6 and say, oh my gosh, I really do need to be order me a more robust. And I think people should be paying more for their HL6. And I have always told insurance companies, I don't understand how you can cover all that you do for the Manini premium that you charge. So yes, I think that's where we're going to see it going up. I want to thank you for being here today. And I guess my word of wisdom to all of our viewers out there is make sure you're adequately insured, your limits of liability and your coverage is adequate to protect your family because if it's not, in the end, you're going to have to suffer if there is, unfortunately, some kind of event. I want to thank Sue, one of my very dear friends and smartest person I know in insurance oh, in Hawaii, uh, for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Condo Insider, where we continue to talk about different issues in disasters. So thank you for watching.